I would try and bring the end user in as soon as possible to the conversation and to always be thinking about what's in it for them. Welcome to Compromising Positions. I'm Leanne Potter, cyber anthropologist and head of security operations for a major retailer. And I'm Jeff Watkins, a cybersecurity enthusiast and CTO for a major tech consultancy. Together, we're the award-winning tech podcast that asks non-cybersecurity professionals what we in the industry can do to make their lives easier. And help make our organizations more prepared to face ever-changing human-centric cyber threats. We're on a break this episode because we're speaking at the AI for the Rest of Us conference and just didn't have time really. So <laughs> we're dreaming one from the vaults. Shift Happens, featuring Paula Sizek. She's the Chief Research Officer at Nobel Collective. And in this episode, we're talking about cha 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 changes <laughs> Nice. This is a great episode, and I've used several of the concepts from it multiple times after it was recorded. But before we go, a quick shout out to the YouTuber, A Super Guy, who's been leaving great comments on our videos. Mm. And listeners, please feel free to join them. Please, we love reading them. So, normal service will resume next week. So, we'll see you next time. Keep secure, and don't forget to ask yourself, am I the compromising position here? I am very excited today. We have got such a wonderful guest. I had the pleasure of speaking to Paula before we recorded this podcast a couple of weeks beforehand. I've just been thinking about the things she's been saying ever since, and I can't wait for her to to share her experiences and her journey. But who better than to say what you do all day, Paula? So tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Well, first of all, we were just talking about vishing before we started recording. So I don't even know if this is me, right? This, this could be my voice just telling you something that I do. But but whoever I am, no, I'm Paula, and I'm Chief Research Officer at Nobel. And what we do is we work with companies that are going through a change in behavior. Essentially, they're changing their strategy. They have a new vision. They're growing. There's a new challenge that they need to tackle because the market has shifted. And we help those companies actually learn new behaviors and adapt new ways of working so that they can better operate in that new environment. We do culture change, but a lot of times people think culture is too fluffy, but culture is just how you work. And so that's that's what I do. I go in and I help companies figure out how we're going to work in this brave new world. And change. Change is scary. Change is scary for a lot of people. And I can totally see why businesses would want to hire someone like yourself to help them on that journey. What, what do people, obviously they seek out your services, but what do they tend to think about change in the broader sense before they start working with you? Well, it depends on the individual. The leaders that we speak with, of course, are usually really excited about change. They have a vision for the future. They're motivated. They, they want to do things differently. The challenge is that not everybody shares that same vision. And of course, there's always the problem that change, even if it's right, even if it's for the best reasons, also involves some elements element of loss. Now, a lot of times when we think of loss, we think of it maybe in our personal lives, but we see it in the workplace as well. So some of the most common types of loss that we'll see when we're talking about changing behavior at work is loss of time and confidence. If you have to learn a new way of doing things, you're just going to not be as good at it as you used to be. And that means it's going to take a lot more time. And if you aren't getting other things deprioritized, if you still have the same amount of things to do on your list, that's going to be a really difficult feeling for you. So of course you're going to resist it. A lot of times there is a loss of pride or a loss of narrative. People have been working hard up until this point. They're doing their best for their company. And all of a sudden somebody comes in and says, wait a minute, that's not what we want to do anymore. Again, a lot of times we see leaders are so excited. They want to jump in to say like, that was the old way of doing things. This is the right way. This is the new way. And that makes people feel devalued or it makes them feel confused. Like, wait, why were we, why, so why did we put all that energy into it. And so it's really important to praise them for their contributions and explain why the change is happening now. And I think with that, and correct me if I'm wrong, I imagine the re reason why leaders are really excited about change is because they've actually been talking about this change for ages, you know, in the exec rooms, uh, in meetings, and then they just announce it. There's not had much of a consultation with anyone kind of below the C-suite level. So the exec team, this change isn't a big change, like as in a big brand new shiny change. So then they've been talking about probably for a while but to everyone else below that it's like whoa you're kind of messing with my universe here is that is that what you see or is yeah it's getting better yeah we always say that leaders actually have to um start at the end because when leaders decide to change they actually go through the end date and they make the decisions right talking about loss loss of control often they're the ones calling the shots and people who are on the end just feel like change is being forced 
upon them. It's happening to them. So we say, look, leaders, if you want to bring people along on the journey, one, it's important to acknowledge they're not in the same position. You've had time to come to terms with the change that's happening. You've shaped the change and now you're announcing it. But people are at the very beginning of that. So you need to bring them along on the change. Give them options. See if there's ways you can pull them in earlier and actually give them an opportunity to transition, to make that transition, to acknowledge the end, get excited about the future and to realize, unfortunately, it doesn't happen overnight. People aren't necessarily good at drop of a hat. You wake up one day and you're like, I'm going to do everything differently. Or if you, you do see if that happens, it's not long lasting. Uh, the first time you'll have a challenge, people will just sort of give up. Um, or maybe the two of you have had much better luck with New Year's resolutions. Uh, Did you know what you, I um, think about with that is the Charles Dickens story and uh, Scrooge, you know, wakes up that morning. He's like, I'm going to change everything. Do you know what I'd really love? What does day two look like for <laughs> Mr. Scrooge? Because I can't imagine he sticks with this very long. I can't, that, that kind of flip, no way. Even with an existential threat. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I saw. I, I read a, a really interesting way of phrasing innovation the other day. It, it was creative destruction, and then like innovation, blockbusters was doing very well until Netflix came along, and like innovation. In, in or outside of the company, in the, in the kind of the wider ecosystem is a, is a form of change that creates destruction and loss. Yeah, absolutely. It's really easy to say like, oh, of course I would be Netflix in this situation, right? Like I would be the one who's forward thinking and willing to shake up the industry. But yeah, when your paycheck is on the line, when your entire business model could lose money and your bonuses and your promotions and all of the company incentives are tied to the old way of doing things. Yeah, that's a really hard thing to find about. Again, could be the right decision, could absolutely be what's needed in your industry. But if it's not set up to encourage and to tolerate that loss, honestly, you won't be able to make the systemic change, which is necessary to get everybody on the team moving forward, not mm. just one or two people. And, and I think when we talk about getting everybody on the team moving forward, I don't know how much experience you've had in, in your uh, time in this kind of role is, is security teams. I think security teams, you know, change Changes risk and and sometimes that that moves slowly and with a great deal of suspicion. Have you have had many dealings with security teams and how that kind of affected business mm -hmm. change? So we don't work directly with team with security teams as much. Um, we work all throughout the organization. We're industry and we're function agnostic. But it is interesting. We haven't gotten as many calls from security teams. Usually we work with them because a team is trying to install new software. They're trying to, they've, they're realizing, hey, our existing systems aren't working. We need to upgrade. We need to introduce a totally new system so that we can work more effectively. We're more remote these days. And inevitably what happens is it gets to like the IT security team and they say, no, this is too <laughs> risky. This is too dangerous, right? And that can really hamper the change that's happening. And what we see a lot of, which uh, to be clear, I'm not encouraging this, but people will find workarounds. And so even though the security team is like, no, you can't do this, people will say like, okay, well, I'm going to figure out a way to do it anyway. And oftentimes those ways of doing it are far riskier and far less secure than what the original proposition would have been. And so, yeah, this is always a, a difficult balance or tension. I don't think you're ever going to totally resolve it. We would never say throw caution to the wind. It's it's always a challenge to, to balance those tensions and identify what are the trade-offs, what makes sense in this given situation, and what are the real risks that we're facing? Because a lot of times it's not necessarily a detailed assessment, of what the risks are. It's sort of just a blanket. No, we're not doing this because it's risky. So yeah, exploring that and understanding. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes really it is too much of a risk and that's okay. You could say like, no, this is, this is a risk we are not willing to take. But if you say that to every proposition that teams come up with, um, they're probably going to try and find ways around you. And I wonder if, you know, in, in the work you do, you've, you've actually seen that maybe not in a context of security, but you know, you're, you're coming into an organization to help implement change. And I know when I've worked in organi organizations that have huge change propositions, and if you're not on board with that change, you don't agree with that change, you're going to 
just say, well, it can't be done this way. Oh, and yeah. you can't do that. So I imagine that you've probably come across instances where the people you're trying to help through this journey have, have thrown things that you say, no, we can't do this way. It doesn't have to be spirit related. But how have you dealt with those kind of, I'm putting blockers in for blockers, say, because that, because it's self-preservationist, yeah. I imagine, that people don't want things to change. So they will make excuses for things that cannot change. So the first thing that we do is we actually try to counsel the leaders that we're working with to not automatically assume that it's an excuse, right? Mm -hmm. Which is really hard because, again, if you're a leader, you're motivated to make change. You want to do things differently. And so to you, it sounds like people are just making excuses, right? Like they just don't want to make the change. That's it. These people are old fashioned, they're sticking in the mud, they're lazy, whatever. You can come up with a lot of reasons for why they don't want to change. And sometimes that's legitimate. Sometimes people really just don't like the new way of doing things. But sometimes those reasons are correct. Sometimes people do have legitimate reasons for why this change is a bad idea or why it's risky or why we shouldn't do it. And so the first thing that we would encourage leaders to do is take a step back and, and not even be more objective, but try and get more curious, try and be more mm. empathetic about that person's position and and explore, okay, why are they experiencing this resistance? What is in their way? And how do I help them navigate that? How do I remove that particular barrier? Uh, a little bit of a plug here. We actually identified about 25 different reasons slash excuses why people resist change. And we put them into a card pack called change barriers. They're kind of like tarot cards. Nice. And so when you're... When you're hearing these reasons, or like I said, excuses for why change can't happen, it helps you identify, oh, that's why they're experiencing this resistance and here's how to overcome it. Um, but yeah, I think the first step is to not automatically assume that people are against change and that they might have valid reasons for their resistance. Well, Paul, I'm, I need to know more about these cards because I know I know Jeff is keen, I'm keen. Anything mm. kind of you can use as a tool, I'm, I'm always really keen. Yeah. So tell me more about these cards. So like I said, this is because we've worked with so many teams and we kept hearing some of the same challenges that would come up time and time again. And so we were like, all right, well, maybe there's something here. Maybe we can figure out a way to help leaders overcome it. And so what we've done is, like I've said, we've identified sayings, re reasons that you might hear coming from your team, such as like we were just discussing, we can't do this. It's going to cannibalize our business. Like the Netflix blockbuster example, this won't be a popular move, right? You know, there's going to be politics involved and that's going to be really messy. You'll hear people say, you know what? This is great. We're on board with the change, but we have other priorities right now. We can deal with this later. We don't have the resources. We don't have the skills. Uh, similar to honestly, a lot of security. Uh, legally, we can't make this change. Sometimes there are literally restrictions, regulations, rules that mean, no, you can't make this change. And it doesn't mean that innovation in that space, that change in that space is impossible. It just means you have to think about it differently and see, all right, how do I still accommodate those rules? How do I accommodate the security levels and still deliver a better experience to the users. Amazing. So, so how would you use these cards? So we'll use them in a couple of instances. One is when a leader first comes to us and says, I'm trying to make change and it's just not happening. I'm mm -hmm. not seeing progress. I'm not seeing momentum. And so we'll spread them out on the table. There's, like I said, about 25 of them. And we'll ask, what, if, what resonates with you, right? Which of these cards sounds like something that you're hearing within your workplace? And then once they've sorted out maybe the top two or three, we'll talk through, okay, again, what does that look like in your organization? How do people resist? And then what do we need to do in order to overcome that? Another time it's really useful is if you are not quite in the change making stage, but you are in the, you're thinking about making a change and you can sort of as a pre-mortem think through like, oh, I bet I'm going to experience this. And we're definitely going to hear people say like, no, it's fine. It's fine as it is. Why are we changing things? Uh, so it helps you sort through. Realistically, no no matter what you do, change is constant, right? Mm. Especially in today's environment. You're never going to get to a point where, oh, you're done with change. So you're always going to be facing different types of change resistance. And honestly, we say that's okay. The fact that you are accomplishing some and moving those to the side and experiencing new types of change barriers means that you're actually making change. Like, congratulations, you're doing it. This is, this is what progress feels like. We found them a really good conversation starter. And again, really helpful for understanding different 
different perspectives because what might be someone saying like, oh, that's not going to work here might sound like an excuse to you, but maybe they've been in the company for 15 years and they've seen the same attempt over and over again. Okay, let's find out why. Let's be a little curious about what's going on so that we can actually make it different this time. Is that card available to purchase, things like that? Is it something I could put in the show notes? They can They can contact us. Usually what we do is we do it as a workshop, but I can probably do a special thing for your viewers if they ask nicely. Oh, amazing. So what, what an offer. I'm, I'm part of an organization that's rapidly growing and undergoing a great deal of change. This all hits a big chord with me. And, it, you know, IT is very dynamic, but still change is hard. Even in a dynamic environment, I could understand mm-hmm. it in maybe an industry that hasn't changed in 50 or 60 years, although I'm not sure there's too many of them left nowadays. But in, in tech, even then, change is hard. I guess, so you just mentioned that kind of that in itself is like a little model, microcosm of something that can get people like a hook. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other principles or models that you use when you're thinking about change? Our philosophy is there's actually two ways that change happens in organizations. If it happens, again, a lot of organizations really struggle to change. But there are two ways to change. One is what we would call fail-safe change. And these are your big changes that you really need to get right the first time. Uh, Think of your reorgs. You don't want to be doing a reorg every six months. You want to get it mostly right. People don't like being reorged and moved into boxes. But the good news is that most changes that happen within an organization are what we would call safe to fail. These are choices that actually benefit from iteration. This is all of your process and your decision making. This is really the day to day of how the work gets done. And so whenever organizations are thinking about, okay, how do we change? How do we become more adept and uh, respond appropriately to the changes in our environment, we say, what can you do differently today, right? Like, what are some smaller changes that you can experiment with to see if it works? And so that's what we'll do. We call it starting with a skateboard. Uh, We've stolen this from Spotify. It's the idea that if you were to, if you want to get from point A to point B, you could build a Cadillac, you could build a very fancy sports car, but I personally have never built a car. So I'm really, it's a very, very, sharp learning curve. It sounds very expensive. I know I'm going to have to get like four wheels and then the axles and then there's like a chassis and we've got to deal with all the electronics and I haven't personally dealt with like a car engine before. Congratulations. Six years from now, I've built my first car and we Mm -hmm. get in and we get to point B and it's like, oh, the market has moved. The market is now at point F and I have now spent millions of dollars and a lot of time and a lot of frustration building this car that doesn't even go where I want it to go. Whereas if I were to build a skateboard, if you were to give me four wheels and a plank of wood, I could actually build that in 15 minutes. I can guarantee that because I did it. There was recently a skateboard building activity at a, at a conference I went to. So I could tell you that any idiot, myself included, can build a skateboard in 15 minutes. Um, So you can do that for a couple bucks and you can push yourself, not gracefully, but you can get to point B and you can do it in an afternoon. And that's going to give you a lot of really important feedback. It's going to tell you, did I want to get to point B? Is that the right destination? Was it a comfortable ride? Do I need more stability? Do I need to wear a helmet? Do I need to attach a handle so it actually becomes a scooter? So you can already start improving the experience based on the feedback that you're getting. And again, applying this to the workplace, it's about, all right, what can I test? What are the simple things I can either start or stop doing to improve this process, to improve the experience for my workers? And sometimes that's not doing a thing. So many times we'll tell people, hey, you need more time. What if you just stopped reading that report? Are you sure people are reading that report? Don't send it for a week and see what happens. Nine times out of 10, no one's like, where's that report? I missed that report. I have literally done that before because there's been some reports where it just takes so much time and effort. And I, I've done it where, you know, maybe I've gone on annual leave and I'm like, I'm not going to actually delegate this task. I'm going to see if anyone notices. And then you come back from annual leave. Nobody says anything. You leave it another week. Nobody says anything. I, ha- I have rechecked and sort of stopped gone. It's been a couple of weeks. You've not had this report. Has this impacted your life in any way? And they go, 
oh, didn't even realize. And all that time and wasted effort. And it's about identifying, you know, working smarter, not harder. But when you were talking then about building a, a skateboard and, and to sort of bring it back to, I think the reason why I got you onto this podcast is because I think cybersecurity handles change badly. And I think not only do we as an industry handle change badly, but also we don't make change easy for the customers we're serving. And our customers is, is big C, customers is our internal employees and colleagues that we're trying to protect our organizations we're trying to protect and our actual customers who use products and services that said company builds and I was just thinking and and I remember when we had our first initial chat and you said something amazing it was just like a total mic drop moment and you said why start with Fort Knox when on the door will do yeah why do we build Fort Knox to start with when we don't even know if Fort Knox is what's necessary maybe we do just need a little tiny padlock and that will be enough and we can kind of build and develop on that but there is the other the other side of that and there's always like a balance when it comes to security and for safety is is in the British idiom it doesn't need to be a Rolls Royce solution and that kind of yeah that's true not everybody builds a walnut dash and a seven litre engine and things but you don't get to choose where you have seat belts and i guess you know because that, that's a basic safety feature i guess it's the the heuristics or the, or the good judgment to figure out what is actually necessary at the time both of those are true things live in tension so what we would typically start by saying is okay let's try and identify a few places where we can test this in a safe environment so going back to the car let's not take it out on the freeway and go really really fast um 70 miles per hour um so we would say like look don't take this out on the freeway to start it is yeah don't start on the autobahn (laughs) yeah it is finding a area of your company again maybe that is with one client maybe it is internal and you're just using it with one group and you test it out for a week or two and you start to identify oh okay this is not working or oh this is what people tend to do we need to accommodate that the idea is to find some environment some context in which even if everything goes wrong everything blows up it doesn't actually have that much of an impact on the business it's something that you can say like ooh that didn't work but you can a little a little paste a little paint and it's fine it's as good as new and so that's that's really why we look for safe to fail change. That's why we call it safe to fail. So that even if everything goes wrong, it, it's okay. It's not going to have a lasting permanent impact on the business. And I would agree with that because I think some of the security controls put in, we could take the time. That obviously, there is some security controls, like something big happens and you know we have to act really quickly. We have to change things. Sometimes there is literally vulnerabilities in our system that have just appeared. Action. People get up in the middle of the night to fix that. Get that. But then there's, there's some things like, oh, we're about to put a maybe a new service live and there's some controls we would like to put in place there it doesn't go live for a couple of weeks maybe maybe a month or so actually let's have a consultation with how we can best serve these controls how we can articulate this change that is coming maybe someone's always had to work in a certain way but you know maybe we're introducing for example two-factor authentication to this process and really really communicating that change so what can i let, let's use that as an example i'm putting in a new service it's you've not had to use two-factor authentication before how would i communicate that the importance of this because I think it's important but to this other person oh, it's another step that's preventing me from doing my job so how do I communicate this change great question so again I would try and bring the end user in as soon as possible to the conversation and to always be thinking about what's in it for them it is to understand oh okay this person is really interested in protecting sensitive client information right because if the client information gets out there their lives are going to be a lot more difficult it could damage the relationship or it could be that two-factor authentication is available because now you can work remotely and you can work from Mm. wherever you want i don't know in this hypothetical what the positives are but i'd be thinking about what are the benefits like why are we doing this as a company because if you just go in and you mandate things and you say we're doing it this way people are like well why this is just another thing i have to do again talking about loss oh this is it's just it's annoying it's it's gonna take up time i'm gonna have to go find like where's the code right it's a really frustrating experience so i would be bringing them in early explaining hey here's what we're trying to accomplish if there is room for them to provide feedback or to provide some sort of collaboration so that they feel like they're helping to shape the system that's great if there isn't if 
legitimately you're like, no, this is how it has to be, then don't ask for feedback if you're not going to do anything right. That's that's a very frustrating experience. That's for a good people. point. So only ask questions. I, I think in, in law, right? Don't ask a question unless you already know the answer. Don't ask for feedback unless you know how to incorporate it. I would be thinking, how do I bring them in? How do I make them feel like they're part of the change, like their needs are being addressed? I would be thinking about the different types of loss that they would be experiencing and how I'm going to help that along and say like, okay, maybe we need to train people right? If this is a totally new system, maybe they just need some really simple training so that when this pops up, they're not like, what do I do? Who do I call? Why can't I get into my account? I've got a meeting with the client in 20 minutes. That's a frustrating experience and it's going to make people want to avoid it or work around. So thinking about how can I help them adopt these? And then I would also be thinking about how do I check in with them after they've been using it and find out how is this experience going for you? How can we improve it? I think that's really important, isn't it? A life cycle and that feedback loop. Um, should continue on there's one thing to ask feedback up front and then implement change and then not see you know what did we did it work how we said it was going to work you know has it impacted you in any new way that we didn't account for even if we think we've caught all the concerns and fears prior has something that we none of us anticipated come up and i think that's incredibly important to just kind of check in there you can't ultimately make people want what you want i'm sorry if that was what you thought i was going to tell you like here's the magic key to getting people to fall in line automatically with your security recommendations. People are going to want what they want. But what you can do, and this is just the basics of negotiation, is figuring out, okay, what is it that they want? What is it that I want? Where is the overlap? How can I find the win-win situation? Or even if it's not win-win, not lose-lose, right? Let's let's try yeah. and find some common ground for why we're making this change. That will make people more willing to at least hear you out and to, to get on board with it. Absolutely. And I, I did read somewhere, you know, they said good negotiation isn't about you coming out better than the other person. It's about both parties leaving feeling good. And I think that is so incredibly important. So what, what kind of negotiation skills have have you learned? Because I imagine change is definitely a negotiable topic. We always like to say that in, in some ways change is not an option, but tra- the transition is, right? Like change is happening all around you mm. all the time and you you may not have a say. Arguably, people are tired of change because the last three years we've had a lot of change forced upon us that we didn't have a whole lot of a say in. Um, and so that's when people get really tired when they, when they don't have a say. The problem with negotiation is we do have that image through TV and through movies of the slick negotiator who is bold and gets what he wants and it's usually a he right and you got to be clever and have the right words and kind of twist people like there's there are a lot of assumptions about what negotiation looks like but ultimately you're just having conversations we say that ultimately work is about relationships with other people it's commercialized it's there for a monetary reason um, among others but that's what it is it is you having a relationship with another individual in order to achieve a larger goal and so however you can approach it and make it more human i think will serve both of you you'll hear a lot about this idea of servant leadership it's the idea that as a leader you're not there to be the hot shot and look good you are there to help your team achieve their goals. And so thinking about what do they want? And everybody's going to have different wants, right? You can't assume all of your team is going to have the same desires. So thinking about, okay, what does this individual want? How do I communicate with them? What's going to motivate this individual? What skills do they need to work in a different way? It's just a different approach and a different mindset and one that's, I think, ultimately more successful than just barging in and saying, like, this is the way that we're going to do things going forward. I think uh, quite often in in the media, negotiation is portrayed more as being a, a type of psychological manipulation than, than an actual negotiation. Yeah. And thinking about that on a more personal level, I think one of the most challenging parts of negotiation is being okay with being uncomfortable. The more truthful that you can be in a negotiation, the more upfront about why we're making this change and what I need from you, I think it feels vulnerable. It feels dangerous because now, oh, that's information they can use against me. But again, it's it's building that relationship and saying like, look, here are the challenges that we're facing. I might not have all the answers. We don't know if this will work 100%. That's a scary position to be in. 
as a leader, you're supposed to know, you're supposed to have all the answers, you're supposed to be right. But working with people to figure out, okay, what is the best thing we can do in this situation? What ideas do you have? How can we make this work? Is I think really important to real change, to not people just saying like, yeah, 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 I'll do it. And then not doing it. Because that's that's another thing. It's not really negotiation. You haven't won until the behavior has changed. Absolutely. And what I was just thinking there about, you know, there's a lot of fear about giving too much away. And when I think about security negotiation, so if we were to apply this, for example, new changes coming in, I need to know, one, one thing I, I talk about recently is like, sinners make the best saints, and that I need to know the, not bad stuff, but the kind of workarounds and stuff that you're doing in order for me to protect against that. And the only way that you're going to tell me about that is if you have psychological safety to do so. And when I was just thinking about then, what you were talking about with the negotiation skills, if I am coming this discussion as a security person and with my stakeholders who are non-security people, how hard is it going to be for someone who's a non-security person to say, actually, yeah, I do engage in risky behaviours, either because the controls you put in place don't help me, or because there's not been that education and awareness on that, or yes, I do know, but I've got a job to do. You know, I've got I've got targets to, I've got deadlines to meet. Security isn't my priority. But how do you have those like open, honest discussions? In if what I'm asking you to disclose to me as a security person is something you know, you know, that cognitive distance you know is not right. It's a really tough thing to kind of get right. And I think probably be able to tell me if I'm right or wrong. You really need to build that psychological safety for people to have that open and honest transactional conversation about, I know I'm doing wrong, but maybe you can help me get onto the right path. Yeah. And let's just maybe define psychological safety. I don't know if all of your listeners know mm. it, but it's this concept that one of the key elements of a high performing team is psychological safety, which means people feel comfortable, they feel they can take a risk in their environment and they won't be judged by the rest of their team. And that doesn't mean showing up to work with a crazy new hairdo, right, a mohawk and it's dyed purple. Um, although, hey, maybe maybe it does in your organization. Um, but no, what it typically means is, hey, I have a new idea that we haven't tried before. Can we try it? Or it means, hey, I have bad news. We missed a deadline. There's a hole in our security. What are we going to do about it? If people don't feel comfortable bringing those bad things to you, if they don't feel comfortable having a conversation, it's just going to get buried. It's just going to be hidden. It can build up over time and lead to some real challenges. So the question then becomes, okay, well, how do I do that? It doesn't happen overnight, especially if you've had a more, shall we say, antagonistic relationship with, with your teams. Just going them to them tomorrow and saying like, hey, I've decided we should be psychologically safe. How are you <laughs> messing up my system? Uh, again, negotiation. You can try it. Let me know how that goes. But it is really thinking about, okay, how do I start to create those relationships? This sounds small, but it's some, we call it a check-in. And this, this is one way. It's at the beginning of a meeting. It's actually starting to build that human connection and saying like, hey, what are you bringing with you? How is your how is your week going? I'm putting a, a time limit on that. Like, don't take the whole meeting. Like, one or two sentences. What are you bringing with you? You know what? My kid's been sick, so I might have to run out of this meeting if I get a call from the doctor, right? Or like, oh man, we have a major deadline in 20 minutes. Can we postpone this, right? Allowing people to share what is involved in their lives gives you some better understanding of where they're coming from. And again, establish those relationships as like, oh, this is this is a person. This is not just a role that I have to deal with. And then I would also be thinking about what are, again, the safe to fail baby steps that I can take? Where are things that I can offer something for them to step into? What are safe questions? Are there areas where like everybody already knows this protocol isn't being followed? So whatever, if people admit to it, it's fine. And then I'd be thinking about, okay, what happens when people tell me something? Do I get upset? Do I say, all right, well, we, we're going to have to file a report about this, right? What is the reaction that happens when they share something that is vulnerable, that is not what they're supposed to be doing? If you can make it so that the reaction is tempered and appropriate and doesn't feel like a punishment, that's going to make people feel more comfortable to step forward and say, hey, this isn't working as we intended or I need help here. What can you do for me? And that just reminded me of an activity I, I do. So I'm part of an improv troupe. And when we do rehearsals, you do rehearsals for improv, you know, you don't actually rehearse what scene you're going to do on stage, but you know, you, you rehearse the game. At the start of every session, the improv leader will turn around and say, is there any things that are no-go areas tonight? Is there anything, if the scene gets physical, where do you not want to be touched? You know, what, we've had people say, actually, I don't want to be engendered with a certain gender tonight and things like that. And just 
being aware of each other and where where the boundaries are with people and doing that right at the start is amazing because it 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 just means that during a scene where you're vulnerable anyways and you you know you're, you're trying to be creative in this space because that's what it's all about is that even though there's boundaries and rules doesn't mean creativity can stop but you're also respecting each other on such a level that it builds that psychological safety now i trust my improv troupe implicitly i because the whole purpose of improv is to make the other person look good and just by establishing those boundaries it's it's an incredible thing to do and i think we don't do that enough particularly in our time boxed environments a lot of us are working hybrid remote and so meetings are every half an hour every 15 minutes no breaks like boom 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 we've got an agenda to get to and just taking that time i think would be so valuable a lot of that reminds me of five dysfunctions of a team and a lot of it, the trust is at the very like the very bottom layer and you, without it the rest of it kind of falls apart i guess change do you have to do kind of a lot of i guess almost like systems design when it comes to designing or helping clients with change so the answer there is yes a lot of our thinking is influenced by complexity science and, and network theory but spoiler alert it's not usually when i what i lead with when i'm talking to a team or leaders and certainly not what i'll introduce at a party because those can sound like very scary and tech words and then it sounds like oh well i have to design for this system so so yes that definitely influences our thinking but again we're always looking for what are the practical implementations of that what are the implications of that and so with systems for example it's the idea that everything is networked every Everything is connected. You don't really know how things are going to be impacted or changed until you do it, until you make the change. A lot of times with organizations, historically, you will get big consulting firms in who will make these long, drawn out assessments and they'll talk to every single person within the organization and then you'll result in a deck which is a hundred slides and it'll have <laughs> recommendations. Now you're like, is this the striking accord? And then they, is, leave it they leave that deck with you and they're like, here's what we would do. Good luck. And then honestly, by the time you're done with that assessment, it might have taken several months. Like the situation has already changed. You have new people in. And so our bias is for action. Like, yes, we'll chat with people, we'll interview people because we want to again establish those relationships and become a known trusted entity. But what we'll push to do is get in and start working with teams to make change in a controlled environment, small changes in a controlled environment and see what actually happens. And then when it does happen, say, okay, let's do a retro, right? Let's look back on that. What worked well? What didn't work well? What do we want to try on our next iteration? That is more important and most importantly actually teaches people how to change. Our goal is to actually increase team's capacity to change. How do you deal with ambiguity? Honestly, how do you start? We've worked with even senior executive teams who don't feel comfortable taking the first step because they're so used to the CEO directing them where to go. And so taking that initiative and being willing to again take a risk a small one is a skill that all organizations really need to develop if they're going to be able to respond to our fill in your buzzword here uncertain vuca etc environment i love that i remember another thing we talked about in our pre-chat and you said risk versus uncertainty and they're not the same thing tell me a little bit more about that so risk is actually known odds essentially it's when you know okay we have a one in 30 or a one in 200 chance that something bad is going to happen and chances are you also have some guidelines some guardrails about how you can respond to that so if you get into a car you have a one in x thousand chance of being in an accident one in thirty thousand who knows so we have rules, we have airbags, and we have seatbelts, and we have uh, driving regulations, right, which try and help you mitigate the risks that you'll be in an accident. Uncertainty is when you just don't know what's going to happen. You have no idea what the odds are. It could be one in two. It could be one in 100,000. It's a new experience that you've never gone through before. You really don't know what's going to happen. And so that's, that's a different situation. It's that ambiguity where people don't know. And a lot of times what happens happens is that teams will think or leaders will think that they know, okay, this is a risky situation and we have to proceed in a certain way, but actually you're just in an uncertain situation and you don't know what the results are going to be, but they won't move forward because they don't know and it feels risky. It feels uncomfortable stepping into the unknown. And so then again, it becomes what small steps can we take? How could we test this knowing that we actually don't know what we don't know so that we can still make progress and we can still improve things in a way that is safe. I want to make 
make it really clear. Fear is okay. Like we've dealt with a lot of teams and if we're moving forward, moving forward and they're like, I don't know, this just, just this feels risky. We'll stop. We'll stop and explore that. We'll be like, okay, why does this feel risky? Maybe do some scenario planning. What could happen here? What are the risks? Especially with experienced teams, like they've seen a lot of things happen. Like let's respect those instincts and explore those a little. We're not going to be the team who's like, no, just go for it. Fight through your fears. Like there might be a reason. Sometimes that fear might just be you. It might be uncomfortable for you personally because it's new and you haven't done it before. In which case, okay, we'll say, okay, like how do we make this safe for you? How do we make you feel like, okay, I can make, I can take this risk and it's going to be all right. Because leaders who are acting who are scared and fearful are not going to be in a best position to support their teams either, right? You're going to be on edge. So it's acknowledging and respecting the feedback that you're feeling as an individual, as a team, and also working through it. Again, it doesn't mean this feels risky, let's stop everything. But it says, all right, this feels risky, this feels uncertain, we don't know what's going to happen. Let's explore that. Let's put some guardrails or precautions into place so that we can avoid worst case scenarios. And then let's move forward in a way which feels supported, feels like, okay, we can manage this risk together. Going back to a couple of minutes ago, you mentioned talking about retrospectives or kind of post-mortems on things. Do you often run pre-mortems on, on changes? And how, oh, how, yeah. how, how would you go about that? Because I think not a lot of people do that and it might be a new concept for some people. We do a variation on pre-mortems. We'll do two, depending on how the team is feeling. We'll either do a regular pre-mortem where we'll say, okay, let's project ourselves into the future. And everything has been a total disaster. This project is a flop. What happened? What does it look like? What does it feel like? And this is always fun. People always have a really easy time coming up with like a lot of the ways that things could go wrong. Um, and then we'll say, okay, that's that's what happened. What can we do to prevent that? This is not an exhaustive activity. It doesn't help if people are like, aliens, come down right like destroyed <laughs> civilization that that's not the sort of pre-mortem we're just looking for things that are common that they've like seen before within their organizations that based on their experience they see like oh this this could be a uh, problem with this implementation so what are the common and also impactful things that could happen in this scenario and then just again identifying a few small things they could do now to prevent that from happening or if they do see it happen how are you going to address that so that it doesn't become a much bigger issue. And then the flip side of that is we'll say, okay, let's do a positive pre-mortem. This has been a success. What does that look like? And this is always fun because now people get to think about all the good things that could happen. What did we do? How do we operate so that we get that desired outcome? What can we do now to start making it a success? And again, these are usually not like huge major changes. It's things like, you know what we should be doing as a leadership team, check-ins every two weeks, just to make sure this is moving along and we're not seeing any problems. Or it could be that, hey, we need to put together a checklist to make sure we don't miss any of the major steps while we're doing this implementation. Let's make sure we get all the basics done. So really simple things that your team can apply, honestly, within the next like two weeks and checking in on that and making sure it's moving forward helps set teams up for success. Could you just leave us with a couple of hints, just a couple of tips, like imagine if a cybersecurity team, they're the ones quite often needing to make, in some case, enforce change in some way or maybe introduces a softer word, a few tips that they can take away tomorrow to start making that process better for all concerned. Identify a couple of your end users, figure out what it is that they need, what's in their best interest, and then actually start testing with them. See if you can invite them into the conversation earlier and explaining why you need to make these changes and what's in it for them. And just, again, starting small. Like, don't try and implement a giant program all at once. Some Sometimes you have fail-safe change, it's got to be right, and that's fine. But if everything is fail-safe, safe change, if everything is these big implementations, you're going to lose people. Breaking down that change into small bites, figuring out how you can help people along the way will get you a lot farther than just trying to and demand it. I like to give the example of people ask like, how long does it take to change an organization? Three years, honestly, like to make sweeping 
changes to the entire organization. Like if you look at Steve Jobs, who is overused as an example, but when people think of leaders who have like total control of their organizations, it still took him three years. And he was very much a like command and control, like this is how we're doing things. It still took three years to turn around Apple. And so making those big changes is really quite hard. So it, it's much easier if you can break it down, make it smaller and bring people along on the journey. I've definitely got some things I want to take back to the office when I go back in. Paula, if people want to reach out to you, how can they find you? So you can visit our website, which is at nobel.io. That is N-O-B-L dot I-O. And of course, please feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. I am Paula, last name C-I-Z-E-K. As far as I can tell, there's only one of me. So it shouldn't be too difficult to find me. I like talking about change and, and making a difference. So love to connect with interested listeners. 